All right, so welcome to the angiosperm lecture. This is the second part of our seed producing vascular plant lecture that we're talking about that we want to cover. Um, so what I want to do is run through the basics of angiosperms. For those of you who are new to this format of lecture, as I go through the slides, I want you to be taking notes, whether you do it on a piece of paper in your notebook or you download the PowerPoint and fill it out as we go. And that's completely to you. But take notes. Do not just sit and listen and watch the slideshow. You're not going to absorb the material as well. You need to be writing down the content and then going back and using your notes as you prepare for the quizzes and the exams. So others of you, Online learning is no big deal. Several of you I know took my Bio 111 in the online format. This is going to be exactly, I'm trying to make this exactly like the Bio 111 format. Okay. All right. So angiosperms. Well, the ancestor of angiosperms and gymnosperms diverged about 305 roughly million years ago. So that ancestral species, group, whatever it was, that split and then gave rise to these different lines. Um, that group that was there 305 million years ago and earlier was not an angiosperm, was not a gymnosperm. It was something different. But it gave rise to these plants we see today. They carried forward certain characteristics. The most recent common ancestor to all the living angiosperms goes back roughly, um, they're putting it about 145 million years ago, somewhere in there. Um, that's what the evidence right now is indicating. So, all right, so when we look at angiosperms, we often group these guys into phylum anthophyta. So we talk about domain, eukarya, kingdom plantae, phylum anthophyta. If we go back to classification with the protists, remember plants were grouped under a different supergroup. We're going to keep it simple and keep talking about plants in the kingdom plantae and then focus on just a couple of the key phylum that are found there. Uh, the oldest angiosperms are what we call the basal angiosperms. And it's estimated these guys were around from 100 and actually let me reverse that 199 to about 167 million years ago is what that window was uh, some of that's molecular based data we do have fossil evidence saying absolutely at 125 million years ago we had flowering plants there's the carpal the stamen some of the key structures necessary to qualify a plant to be a flowering plant. Um, I can tell you angiosperms are by far the dominant plant group on earth today. You look out your window right now, take a walk outside, and the vast majority of the plants you come across are going to be angiosperms or flowering plants. So they will dominate terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, they are incredibly adaptable. So what I want you to do, there's four dashes here, four key features that make angiosperms adaptable. Make sure you're good with these things. So first key feature, flowers. Flowers, and this isn't ranked in order, but one of the key features, flowers. Those connect most angiosperms to specific pollinators. Not all of them use animal-based pollinators, but Flowers are a huge advantage. The vascular system enables those angiosperms to grow tall, conduct nutrients, move fluids within their body. Not only can they move nutrients and fluid from the soil to the, from the roots through the shoots up to the leaves, but they can conduct sugars and things from the leaves back down. They can also conduct other things things like defensive compounds, chemicals, toxins, etc., for protection. So vascular system becomes really, really helpful, not only for your own growth, but also for a defensive system. Uh, a lot of angiosperms 
have partners in the animal world, the animal pollinators, where they work together. We'll get into this more later on. Both benefit from that typically. And then angiosperms do this crazy thing called double fertilization. So I want you guys mentally, but also I would make a big note of this, go back and look at the pine fertilization process. You know, pollen grains moving from the male cone to the female cone, how that whole process works. Angiosperms do a little bit differently. They do double fertilization. So there's actually going to be two sperm swimming their way towards the egg to fertilize the egg. And again, we'll get into these things in more detail as we go through the lecture here. So, all right, so you know the key features, or you've been introduced to the key features. Make sure you know the key features. So, all right, now let's take a look at a general flower. There's all sorts of variations and differences and you know, tweaks and twists on the flower structure, but they all have the same basic parts. So let's start with on the right-hand side here the thing known as the carpal. So the carpal is going to be composed of three different components. So the tip of the carpal, the thing that sticks up, this is known as the stigma. Now the stigma is going to be the little landing pad. That's where the pollen grains will stick to it whether they come in by air or an insect brushes up against it, that's where the pollen from the male plant or male portion attaches to. The stigma is on top of a stalk known as the style. So the tube, the style allows the pollen to move down the length of the stalk and eventually reach the ovary. Now down within the ovary, will be these little structures known as the ovules. So the ovary is a structure that will house the ovules. The ovules are where the eggs will be. So just like in a human or an animal, females have an ovary, that's where their eggs are contained. The ovule is a structure that is going to be the egg structure here. Um, other key structures, the stamen, so over on this side here. The stamen is going to be the structure that is composed of the anther. This is the tip here that actually produces the pollen. And then the filament, which is the stem or stalk that supports the anther. So easy way to remember this, when we talk about carpal, Carpal is the female structure. Stamen is the male structure. Okay. Other key things pay attention to the petal or petals. There's going to be a variation on the shape, the size, the color, how many, etc. But petals are there primarily to attract the pollinator. Can I lure in the hummingbird or the bee or the moth or the bat? And what you'll see as you learn more about flowering plants. There's a correlation between petal color and pollinator. So bees tend to go towards yellows and those types of colors. Hummingbirds prefer reds. Moths and bats, because they're primarily pollinating at night, go for white, white petals because it shows up. Okay. And then the last key structure to mention is the sepal. The sepal, it looks like leaves, but it is not a leaf. The sepal is the structure that will close up over that flower before the flower is going to emerge. It, it protects the flower. And then that sepal, when it's triggered by temperature, moisture, and light levels, the sepal peels open and that allows the flower to emerge out. So it's your protective shield is what the sepal does for the flower. It's not really doing a whole lot with photosynthesis when we talk about the job of the sepal, mostly protection of the flower. So, okay, all right, so there's a hyperlink here. I encourage you guys to click it, go out to the flower blooming picture or little video. Um, if the link rot has rotted, please let me know, but last time I checked it, it's working. 
um, but it shows you how the flower blooms. And as we move towards Easter, I want you to think about lilies. That's what this flower here is. The flower is specialized for sexual reproduction in these plants. That is the whole purpose of that structure on the plant is to sexually reproduce. It does not do asexual reproduction with the flower. It uses other parts of the plant for asexual. But the whole job here is exchange of genetics, cross fertilization, can we increase genetic diversity? That's why flowering plants are so dominant on today's in today's world, because they've done all the things they need to do to be successful. So, okay, let's take a look at the general life cycle. And we can walk through all the different steps. So we'll talk about the structures. We're going to put it into real-world application, what we will hopefully be seeing in the next month to month and a half when we look at one of the most prevalent angiosperms in the state of Illinois, corn. All right, so the life cycle starts when the seed germinates. So corn seed gets put down into the ground. Hopefully by April, early May, we'll be done with the rain and farmers will be in the fields planting their fields. So they'll use their planters, they'll be dropping seed down into the ground, and then the seed germinates based on the temperature. Oh, lost my. Let me go back up here. Primarily, or particularly, soil temperature ah. and water those are the two key factors for the germination of the corn seed so again usually april or early may you know, if you're not in the fields and planted by late may you're you're running into problems uh usually it's about a two to three inch depth rate for that seed to be put down into the ground and then that seed has to germinate. Yeah, that's going to take three days to two weeks, depending on environmental factors. The germination happens, and then all of that energy goes into producing this thing known as a coleptile, and then the foliage leaves, so the plant can run photosynthesis. Apical meristem tissue is what's causing the upward growth, or the growth is coming from that tissue group. It's got a vascular system, it has a dermal tissue, it has the um, ground tissue. All of the energy is going into growth here for the next 110 to about 140 days before that plant is mature enough to say, time to reproduce. Okay, so you think about that, that life cycle happens within the span of about four and a half, five months, start to finish. Other plants, like the oak tree we talked about back in previous lectures, start to seed production, to offspring, to sexual reproduction in an oak, might take five to 10 years before that tree is mature enough. The pine tree, how many years before that pine is big enough to actually reproduce? Certain angiosperms fast. Again, that's one of the reasons why they are so darn prevalent and dominating on earth today. So, all right, I'm going to pause the lecture here. I'm going to set up a next hyperlink, click on the button that says video link two, and that'll take you to the next 15 minutes of the lecture.